I'm going to ask you guys, just point blank. You're in church, so don't lie. you got to tell me the truth, okay? How many of you would admit, Pastor Tony, I can tell you honestly that I remember a time that I said something dumb and I stuck my foot in my mouth. Go ahead and raise your hand, okay? Uh, if, if you don't have your hand raised, I want you to go back to listen to the message that I preached about lying. It's, it's in the, on the YouTube. Uh, you can go back. We all do it. We all say dumb things. I, I've, I've got a couple of illustrations, uh, but I'm going to wait. I'll give them to you here in a minute. And they're personal illustrations of dumb things that, I'm, that I've said before. And, and some of you probably say, oh, I've got a list of those. I, I, that's all right. Everybody does. Uh, I talk a lot. I'm up here a lot. I interact with people a lot. And, and I say a lot of dumb things. So I'll, I'll give you some illustrations of that. But I want to start verse 28. And to be honest, I almost skipped it. I, I was one of those things that I thought, no, we don't have a problem with this. But I think it's important that, man, if it's, in, if it's in the Bible and we came across it, I just want to give it to you. And, and it says this biblical habit that God gives us in verse 28. Now listen to this. And none of this at the beginning is going to be like, what? The Bible says that. Listen, let him that stole steal no more. I don't think anybody's going to be like, like, the Bible says we can't take other people's stuff that doesn't belong to us. That's not like shocking to anybody. But let, him, but let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The, the opening thing of what not to do is pretty obvious. It's don't take what's not yours. Don't steal. The don't, don't, I, I don't care, and guys, so just so you know, it's, <clears throat> this is talking about everything from Grand Theft Auto to, oops, I forgot to scan that at the self-checkout. And sometimes we justify these things because the mindset is, well, it's a big corporation. They're not going to miss this. Let me tell you, it's not about what they're going to miss. It's about doing what's right. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are, are, are beholding. It's beholding the evil and the good. God sees it all. It's not about what I can get away with. It's about doing what's right, about living out what is right. It's, and so uh, any form of taking what is not yours is wrong. But the habit that we're talking about is not don't steal but listen to this. The habit that we're talking about is work hard. Now, now, let me read this. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather. So it's saying this is what we don't do. But then the Bible implement, implements what we should do. Listen to it. But let him labor. I know in today's terms that might be viewed as like a cuss word or you know, offensive language. But let him labor, working with his hands, the things that is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. The word labor is a cool word. There's a Greek word in the Bible, and the Greek word, the definition of that, literally means to work hard. That's what the word means. It means for those that are able. Now, before you get into it, you're going to say, Pastor Tony, not everybody can do that. I know there's some that are retired. You've worked hard. Praise God for it. You're in a good place. There's some that have disability. And you just say, Pastor Tony, I'm limited. I can't. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the Bible is saying that if you can work, you should. You should take your hands in labor and do a good work because what, that's what God's called us to do. The way that God, had, God provides for us and the way that God provides for our family and God, the way that God provides for our livelihood is through work. Working hard is biblical. Working hard in, in, in this is, is, is a healthy way of living. It's the way that God's called us to. It, it should be part of the DNA of the Christian is to work hard. It's a cool word. It, it not only means to work hard. The word in, that Bible, in the Bible Greek, it literally means to be fatigued. To work in such a way that you give yourself so much that you walk away a little bit exhausted or tired. And sometimes we just work as long as we can and then be like, I'm worn out, I'm not doing this. But working hard is a good thing. Teaching our kids to work is a good thing. Oh, I, that was really weak. You guys know that this is audience participation. <laughs> You're like, I don't know about that. Let, let me say it again. Teaching our kids to work hard is a good thing. It's a good thing. Trust me. And if you don't teach them to work hard when it comes to go out and cut the grass and they start sweating, they come in and it goes, it's really hard. It's going to be really hot. That's part of life. Go cut the grass. Take out the trash. It smells. I know. It's part of life. Go take out the trash. You know why? Because for the rest of their life, they're going to have to work. 
And the Bible says, teach them to do a good thing by using their gifts, talents, and abilities to apply themselves to life. And it goes for all of us. It is something that God's given us to do to provide for ourselves, and it's okay to be fatigued. It's okay to work eight hours or ten hours. It's okay to work a full-time job. Work hard. Teaching our kids to do this. From the time they're small, the Bible says to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, well, they will not depart from it. If you get to the point where you can't keep a job because everybody offends you, and it's hard. Life is hard, okay? I'm telling you the truth. Life is hard. It's not easy. And nobody's going to be there for the rest of your life just to give you handouts. That's not how life is. God says if you're going to have provision for your family to work and apply yourself. But notice this. There's There's an outpouring of this. There's a result of it. For Christians, it's not just about I'm getting by. He said at the end of that, he may give to him that needeth. God uses us as just a, a middleman from the blessings of God to others. We, we think of that when it comes to church. We would not be here without tithes and offerings and people giving to the church. We have the giving boxes. I'm going to work hard so I can invest in others. We do this with missions. I'm going to work hard to invest in others. We do this with homeless ministries. We do this with the food pantry. We do this with our neighbors. I'm going to give of what God has given to me for the sake of other people. Habit number three. Work hard. But habit number four is something that I think really affects every single one of us in this room. It really does. I said that I've said some dumb things. I, I was standing right here, can't, closing out the service. And back in the day before we were a little more organized, it used to be where somebody would just have something to announce. And I wouldn't even know what it was. And we don't do this anymore, praise God, we're more organized but somebody would come up and slip me a piece of paper during the invitation and said, don't forget to announce this. And I'd like pull it open. I'm trying to look and see and be, you know, like engage in the invitation. And they said, we have the ladies thing coming up. And they said, there's a table in the back where they can sign up for, uh, to, to be part of it. And so my mind is going in a thousand different directions. I struggle with the ADD thing. It's like, you know, I'm trying to work, think about closing out the service and all this other stuff. So I just said it really fast. I said, if you're interested in one of our ladies, you can sign up for one of them in the back. <laughs> it's literally how I said it. And everybody is laughing. And I'm like, what's so funny about that? It's a ladies meeting. You ladies should be there. And everybody's laughing. I'm just curious in this room, how many of you were here when I said that you remember that? If you, okay, yeah, this group definitely remembers. All right. And I was like, and everybody was laughing and I didn't know why. And it was so weird. Uh, I, I had somebody in our church that came to me and said, hey, at the banquet that we're having, I'm bringing my mom and some of my family. My, I really want you to meet my mom. I was like, I really want to meet your mom. So they're sitting at the table, and I remember seeing him, and I went out behind him and put my hands on his shoulders and leans over the talk, and I couldn't see them from the front. And I said, I'm so honored to be able to meet his mom. And she looks at me, and she says, I am his sister. (laughs) And she never came back. I don't know why. I was in connecting point. I was in connecting point. And I'm talking to this lady, okay, and I started talking about the, the, the complications, and I know it's hard and everything to be pregnant and live life and everything. You guys know where I'm going with this? <laughs> and she stopped me. And I, I promise you this is the exact words out of her mind, out of her, her mouth. She literally says to me, she says, Pastor Tony, I am fat. I am not pregnant. <laughs> How do you bounce back from that? And I I don't even know why somebody was making a comment about them being pregnant and got in my mind. And I said, you said, that's horrible. I know it's horrible. And I promise you, these things that people say, they'll, they'll never forget it. It sticks out in their minds. It's like they'll think of me and they'll think of those dumb things. Just be honest. Just make me feel good. How many of you have ever said something dumb like that? Just raise your hand. All right. So we're all in here together. If you came looking for a perfect church, keep keep driving down the road. (laughs) It's not who we are. We're a bunch of mess ups that are just serving Jesus and trying to do the right thing. None of us, all of us have fallen short. Every one of us make mistakes. None of us are like bitter, bigger and better than anybody else. But man, I want to do what's right. And the thing about it is words hold power. Words have an impact on people. And so we get into this passage, the next verse, and it literally starts talking. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. 
but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So habit number four is watch your words. Biblical habit that God has given us is watch your words. You know why we word it that way? Why I word it that way is we're, we're given this? Because <clears throat> it said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Do you know why it mentions it that way? Because you're going to think things that should not leave your lips. Your brain is going to be, that dude is an idiot, but your lips should stop and say, I'm not going to say that. Your brain should put a halt on it and say, that is not right. I shouldn't say that. It's not a matter of us not having thoughts. It's not a matter of us not getting frustrated, irritated, whatever, but it's a matter of controlling the things that we say. Shouldn't leave your mouth. But what is it saying that shouldn't leave our mouths? Let no corrupt communication. So that brings in the question, what is, what is corrupt communication? The word corrupt means rotten. The word corrupt means worthless or bad. The root word of this goes even further and it says to those things that cause hurt or harm. We should not say things and throw out these word bombs that are going to cause hurt or harm to people. Every day we speak words. And what the Bible is saying, the words that we say matter to God. How we talk to our friends, how we talk to our spouses, how we talk to the, the, the lady that's serving us in the restaurant. It, the question is, there, is there corrupt communication proceeding of our mouth? Now, you know what? The number one thing that we're all going to think of when we think of corrupt communication, there's one big one that comes to the top of our mind. That is cussing. We shouldn't cuss, and everybody has a different perspective. It's just words. It doesn't matter. If I say to myself and I don't say to somebody else, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, let, let's talk about this, okay? The question is, is cursing of any level, little curse words, big curse words, bad curse words, is it okay? The thing about it is, the more we're about around these things, the more normal it becomes. It just becomes every day. It's like people will say, well, I grew up hearing that, or I grew up saying those things. But the question is, is it wrong? Let's just start with just a category of this. And I just, my thing is not to tell you how I feel, but I, I want to I cause you to think according to God's word. One of the things that is normal for people to say as a curse word is the names of God. They'll, they'll throw out the word Jesus. They'll throw out the way Jesus Christ. They'll throw out the word God. They'll associate God with the word damn. They, 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 all these different things of that. And you're saying, is that wrong? Well, here's the thing. Have you ever noticed how when it's derogatory things about the names of God that nobody ever uses it with Muhammad? Nobody ever says, oh, Muhammad or oh, Buddha. Why is it Jesus Christ? Why, why is it that a, the a normal cuss word that people will say at the normal of time of frustration, but if we are understanding as Christians, you know, I, I can't control how the world is going to think or what they're going to do, but I can't hold us accountable. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and bless uh, that, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. His name is holy. That literally name means that every name, Jesus Christ, Messiah, Jehovah, God, Jehovah, Nisi, I don't care what name of God it is, it is to be in our minds and in our lives set apart. Okay, I'm not throwing this out there in disgust. I'm not going to misuse it. I'm not going to say it in frustration. I'm not using it as a curse word. I'm not going to say it when it's my mad or I hit my finger. I am not misusing the names of my God. They are holy, they're separated, they're, be, they're purified, they're to be used in honor. And you say, well, it's just a word, it's just a name, then let me use your name as a cuss word. What, what about it being your mama? How would you feel about that if I, if I cussed at your mama or associated that with the word damn? Say, don't do that, because the word damn means to, to bring down condemnation of hell upon somebody. By the way, we should never say GD in that way or be, let it be tolerable in our sight. When we're talking about God, the righteous King of kings and the most righteous person ever, the God in holy, holy and associated with judgment that he should have judgment brought upon him. It is not right. It is spiritual attack. It is wicked and evil in every way possible. The same thing goes with the words damn and hell. And I don't say those in context of cussing. I say those, they're, they're biblical words. Satan loves to take the biblical things that the Bible talks about judgment and condemnation and water them down. So when we talk about damnation, the Bible says that they might be damned who believe not the truth. The Bible talks about it in condemnation. 
And then, yeah, we throw it out all the time as if it's just everyday speech. It should, it should put chills down our spine when we talk about the judgment of God. Not throwing it out like it's nothing. Satan loves to misuse the things that are of God. So how do we know what is right and wrong when it comes to cuss words? And You can't turn to the Bible and say, it doesn't say to not to use the B word or the S word or whatever word. It's like, where, where does it say not to? There's something to be said about understanding culture because the Bible just puts this thing, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He just puts it in this way. So there are some words that we don't use today because of the fact is they might have been common language in another culture, another generation. You guys can let your mind go wild of things that used to be culturally accepted, but I would not say them today. You say, why? Because they're offensive to people. They cause people to be stepped back. They hurt like a dagger. The Bible says that's not should come out of the mouth of a Christian. The world acknowledges this. They rate movies based on the age of who should be appropriate to hear those words, based on the language that's involved in it. It's sad if the world that does not live by the standards of God will hold a higher standard of what is right and wrong than us. He says, well, I do. I don't want my kids saying that. Is it a matter of you don't want your kids saying that and you get on to them for saying it, but then you say it yourself? The Bible calls that hypocritical. I don't want you saying that. You shouldn't say that at school. I, you, you can call to school and your, your son just called this other girl, the whatever word. And you'd be like, I, you know better than that. Do they? Because do you say it to your kids or say it around your kids? And then the whole most hypocritical thing we can say to our kids today is, you know, mommy does that or daddy does that, but you know it's wrong for you. Whatever happened to be thou an example of the believers? Whatever happened to living out the example of what is right? I mean, being able for them to follow something that is good and be able to say, I'm training up my child and where they should go by letting them see the example. Some of the things that we are teaching our kids are better caught than taught. Let them see it the way that you treat people rather than what you say in a lecture when you send them to their room. Say some of these words, if I said them from the pulpit, you'd walk out and say, man, no preacher should say that. Let me say, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong for me to say it here, it's wrong for you to say it in the, in the locker room on Monday. It's wrong for you to say it on the ball field. It, it's wrong for you to say it from the bleachers. It's wrong. The Bible says in Colossians 3, it, Now ye also put off these anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth. So the question is, what is filthy communication? Well, the Bible gives us these things. It says, does it edify? Does it build people up? Does that identify you with Jesus Christ? Does it glorify God? Does it please God? You say, why does that matter? Did you ever notice how the next verse ties right into let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth? The Bible says in the next verse, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. The word grieve means to hurt or to quench. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And so when you say things that are corrupt, if you say it to uh, scream it out the window, if somebody cuts you off, or you, you don't scream it, you show it. I didn't do it, by the way. And you, you demonstrate those things, and you say, let, let, let it not proceed out of your mouth. Don't do these things. The, the Bible says that you quench the Spirit of God. You hinder the Spirit of God. Like, I don't know why God's not working in my marriage. or God, I don't know why my kids don't listen to me. You're probably doing it without the Spirit of God helping you. We hurt the Spirit of God. It hinders what God is trying to do. It grieves Him. Let's go further than this. Let no corrupt communication doesn't mean just cursing. It means lying. Gossip. Screaming, yelling. If your family turns into an episode of some sort of reality TV show or talk show or whatever, if it's more like Jerry Springer in your living room than it is being this Christmas Christian atmosphere, something's wrong. If the neighbors know when you're upset and you're fighting all the time, it's like corrupt communication, grumbling, complaining, slander. But this is how to change your life. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to use, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, remove the corruption, put in edifying. So let's break down. Number one, 
your words are a reflection or a window to your heart. The, the whole principle is watch your words. Why? Because your words represent your heart. People say, don't judge me. You can't see my heart. Well, in a way I can. To, to be honest, in a way that I can. You, you see, the Bible says this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. I, I don't have to see your heart. There's a window. I, I don't have to see your heart. You tell what's in your heart by the abundance of what you say. If your speech is constantly corrupt, then there's a corrupt heart. That's not me being judgmental. Let me just say to the guys right now, if you're always talking perverted around about girls and it's always about their bodies and jokes about sex and all these other suggestive things that we say, that's a reflection of your heart. If you're constantly telling dirty jokes, that's a reflection of your heart. For teenagers that clean up their attitude and their language when they're away from their parents, but you'll sit there and text and, and, and try to prove how cool you are to your friends and you're cussing one after another, that is a reflection of your heart. And by the way, you might hide your heart from your, your parents, but you're not hiding it from your God. It, it's about pleasing God. It's, it's not performing. It's not about how I look or how I'm perceived to people. You understand that you serve a God that beholds the evil and the good constantly in your life. It's not about a checklist. He said, I didn't mean anything about it. I just said those words. Well, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's a demonstration of the heart. Your heart, your words represent your heart. Your words also hold power. Now, now just understand this. This is an example that goes all the way back to creation. You think about how God chose to create everything. Everything except man, which God knelt down and, and, and formed out of the dust of the ground. But when it came to, to creation, God used words. Have you ever thought about how cool that is? God could have just said, and he waved his hand, or he did this, or he did that, or God. But it, the Bible says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let the earth bring forth this, and let the sun, and let, let, let. And he did that. So the idea that God gave us, that words go out, and it has an impact. You understand that when your words go out, it has an impact. To have the mindset, it doesn't matter what I say, or if nobody hears me, or if I'm not offending anybody, or I don't feel like it's that bad. There's an old saying that used to say this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hear, hurt me is a lie. I have personally done the funerals for a few teenagers and the story was the same in every suicide of them. That they had a note left behind that they were sick of people running them down. They were sick of being made fun of. They were sick of being called names. They were sick of the people on social media posting pictures and things. Yes, it hurts more than sticks and stones. It matters. You say that I don't. It's a work of Satan. It's an evil communication. It's, it, words hold power. Making fun of someone because of a disability or making fun of someone because they don't wear cool clothes. Making fun of somebody at school because of the fact is they don't fit in or they stand out or they're poor. And people that call names and whatever level, it, it, it's wicked, it's evil. It tears down, it doesn't build up, it doesn't edify, it doesn't show them Jesus, it doesn't show them their value. Couples that have given up their marriage over a statement that has been brought up in an argument or something that was said that struck to their heart that they couldn't get over. Never underestimate the power of words. You think about Hitler. He, 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 he turned a nation to kill thousands and ten thousands of Jews over the, over the power of words. There is false pastors and false teachers that have led people in the wrong direction with the power of their words. Your words hold power. You speak one sentence that can ruin someone's day or lead them to see Jesus Christ with one sentence. How do you use the power of your words? Because the Bible says the tongue of the wise, you the knowledge all right. The Bible says that the wise is different than the fool. Now let, let me explain the fool. The fool, biblically speaking, is someone that, that, that ignores what God says. So if you read the book of Proverbs, it's talking about the fool, the fool, the fool, the fool, all the way through it. It constantly is mentioning it. We talk about the fool as just somebody that doesn't use their brain or somebody that does dumb things. That's not biblically. 
correct according to this. It's someone that says, I know what is right, or I know what the Bible teaches, or I know what my parents have taught me, but I'm going to ignore it. The Bible defines that person as a fool. The Bible says that the, ways, the wise uses knowledge all right. So I take what I know hurts people, or I take an understanding of these things, and I put it in my brain, and I'm going to let that my, be my guide of what I say. But the Bible says the flip side of that is, but, but the mouth of fools, those that ignore the things of God, poureth out foolishness. The, the, the Bible says that this person pours out. This is another way of saying, well, I just give them a piece of my mind. I let them have it. I, I ripped their face. I chewed them out. <clears throat> I, just, I just said whatever came to my mind. Now, sometimes we want to do that. I, I had this guy one time, and I've told this story before. He was calling me, and I had an appointment with that. And I said, hey, this is Tony. And he says, Tony. He goes, are you sure that's your name? And I'm like, okay, how do I handle this? I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, last time you told me your name was something else. And I said, dude. Uh, I'm not a really smart person, but there's one thing that I do know. I know my name. And there's so many things that I wanted to say as this guy was on the phone debating with me if I knew my own name. And in my mind, you know what I wanted to say? Hey, idiot, that's what I wanted to say. But the Bible says that the fool just opens the gate of your mouth and begins to pour out whatever dumb thing comes to your mind. That's what it's saying here. It's, it's, so the Bible says that the, the fool loves controversy. The, the, the fool loves shooting off his middle finger in traffic and making it a habit. The fool loves to bring up strife at a family gathering. The, the fool loves to be able to stir up things and be able to talk about politics in a situation that probably shouldn't be mentioned. The fool loves it. The fool loves to cuss in a teen group chat, even though they know it's wrong, just to get a reaction in response to the others. The Bible says that the fool has no restraint. The fool just pours out whatever they're thinking. And by the way, if you're that person, biblically speaking, you are a fool. And that's not me using corrupt communication. That is me speaking what the Bible defines it as. In today's language, it would simply be, I gave them a piece of my mind. I, I, I let them have it. Every time we do this, every time we do this, we leave behind shrapnel. It's an explosion. It has an effect. It leaves, it leaves casualties behind. Your words hold power. And by the way, nobody's ever walked away from a conversation before and says, wow, what a Christian. I mean, <laughs> wow, that person resembles Jesus Christ. Man, I want to go to their church. Nobody ever says that. The Bible actually says it this way. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart... That man's religion is in vain. So that literally is saying for anybody that does religious things or the acts out like wearing the t-shirt, carrying the Bible, going to church, attending the class, if any man acts religious, but he can't bridle his tongue. You know what the bridle is? It's like a horse where you put it in there and you pull back to control what you want to say. You deceive your own self. To go to that people at work and like, I'd love to invite you to come to our church drama, or our church outreach, our church service, our church whatever. They're sitting there going, I'm not going to. Your religion is in vain. Your testimony is in vain. Because of the power of words. Your words show your heart. Your words hold power. And your words make a difference. It's more than just the power of your words. It's amazing. If you've ever done any kind of construction before, you, you know that if there was a nail and you needed to pound it into a piece of wood, you, you, can, you can take a screwdriver, you can take your hand or whatever. You don't have the power to do that. This holds the power to do that. that this is a tool <clears throat> in, used in the hands of how I, I'm going to do that. But the, 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 the crazy thing is I could build a house with this or I could tear down a house with this. So it's not just about the power that it holds, but the application or the indifference that this can make. And that's what the Bible is talking, talking about. It, it, it says in this passage that your words make a difference. It says in this passage, verse 29, but that which is good to the use. It is how God's giving you this weapon. And Pastor Bryce and I were talking about this message. And he said, if we would view our words like a gun. 
Like, how, how, you, how are you going to point it at somebody? And how are you going to control it? What are you going to, what, what are you going to uh, like, put it on safety? Or when are you going to store it in the right way? <clears throat> if we would use it or understand in the power of what we had <clears throat> with the power of words. It should make a habit, a conscious effort of speaking this way. But that which is good to the use of edifying. <clears throat> like a hammer... I have the ability to build somebody up or tear them down, excuse me, according to the words that you use. It's not just about what you don't say. But what if we had the mindset of understanding what we should say? Notice what it says in here. Use your words to build people up. It says speak to that which is good. It says it uses the word to that which is edifying. Okay, the, the word edifying literally means to build them up. And every single day we have the opportunity to do that. I am just telling you stories from my own experience. Uh, my parents had a burden. My mom especially had a burden to keep us in Christian school when we were growing up. Now, my parents were poor. You guys have heard. I, I just, they, they didn't have money. Uh, it was just a, a completely different world for us growing up. They, ju- they just didn't have money. So my mom went to the Christian school, and she was like, I'll do anything to keep my kids to be able to have this environment for their education. And they said, I'll tell you what, you could work off part of your education or their education by being the janitor of the school. So I would walk the hallways, and my mom would be pushing a cart going to the restrooms to clean up the mess that my friends just made in the bathroom. My mom was an amazing woman. And I remember one time we were at home, and my mom was um, just talking to me or whatever, and I was upset because all my friend's shoes said Nike, and my shoes said Voight. Does anybody know what a Voight shoe is? Raise your hand, okay. All right, you guys know what I'm talking about, a Voight shoe? Okay, it was used to be a Walmart brand. And to me, it was like an embarrassment. I would be walking down the hallways, and my friends would be like, Voight, Voight, you know, they were making fun of me because I didn't have $150 shoes. I had $15 shoes. So I got in the flesh about it. I mean, I, I had hand-me-downs and all this stuff. And I remember going to my mom and I said, Mom, I don't understand why all the other kids get to wear all the cool clothes and I have to wear this junk. My mom turned, tears in her eyes. She looked at me and she said, that's because all my money goes to putting food on the table and working my fingers to the bone so that you can have that Christian education. She says, but obviously that's not good enough to make you happy. And I remember my mom turning around and walking to her bedroom as she weeped all the way to the bedroom. I would rather in that moment, if my mom have like turned and grounded me or took away things or you know, whatever, that struck her so deep and, and I remember that to this day, and I, I would never want to bring it up, but I guarantee you, my mom would remember it to this day, and I guarantee you that I made it right. But words hold power. And how I use it, because really, in reality, if I was walking in the Spirit, and I knew that what God did through my mom to give me what I had, my words should have been more about like, Mom, thank you that I have shoes and thank you that you do so much for me and thank you that you work so hard to give me what I have. So there's, there's, there's an effect, there's, there's power in the words that you say. And the Bible says we're, we're to use them for the act of edifying, to build people up. What if we changed the way that we talked? What, what if we pointed out in our kids' lives the, the character that they have and rather than be quiet, you annoy me, I'm trying to do something. If you spend time with your kids and build them up, just say, hey, I'm so thankful I get to be your dad and I love you. Your, your words hold power. What, what have you said to that waitress that was strung out and wore out and, and just it has to be somewhere and her kids have to be picked up and she's working her fingers to the board to be able to say to her, man, I thank you for your service. I remember there was this one time, it was right before Logan's surgery in 2021, And we had an opportunity to go out. It was me, Logan, and Morgan. We went to the Chili's restaurant. Well, this was during coming out of the pandemic when every restaurant was like really backed up and they didn't have employees and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there. We waited over an hour for our food. But I'm sitting there as somebody that I understand like leadership and things like that. And I watch the manager run up and seat people. And I watch the manager go up and bust tables. 
And I watch the manager run over and pay, uh, the, do the checks for people and refill drinks. Then I also saw the manager one by one have people walk to, up, up to him and like chew him out and saying, this place is ridiculous and I, I'm never come back here again or whatever. And it really affected me. Now, I'm not saying this to brag on myself by any means. But I remember getting up and I went over to that manager and I said, hey, are you the manager? And he turned around like, yeah, go ahead, let me have it, you know. And I said, I just wanted you to know that I've been sitting here and I am so impressed with how you jump in to help all your employees and how you've stepped up to be able to do this. And the guy almost hugged me. I'm not, I'm not kidding. He looked at me and he said, thank, thank you for saying that. He said, we're trying so hard, and I'm telling you, we're trying to keep the doors open and try to help people, but man, it's hard. He said, I really appreciate you going out of your way to say that to me. I'm not saying that to brag on myself. I'm just saying that every single day you have the opportunity to literally build people up or tear them down. I talked about my mom. Let me me reverse the conversation. We were talking about my mom. Uh, I I remember one time I wasn't feeling good at school, and my mom was... uh, Coming up, uh, I, I went to the office and I was telling them, I said, I really don't feel good. Could you call my mom? And you guys, you guys know the deal. I don't know if I was really sick that day or not. I just remember doing that. So don't judge me. You've all done it too. And uh, I, I remember doing this and I was uh, waiting for my mom. My mom pulled up to get me. And as I'm doing this, I, I get out to the car and I remember this so well. You guys know that those experience with your kids that you think wasn't a big deal and you threw out words and you never know how big of a deal it was to them. I remember going the back roads to get back to our house. I remember going around this one corner. No joke. I, re- I remember where I was. I remember what I was thinking. And my mom looked over at me. And she said these words to me. She said, Tony, God's going to use you one day in a big way. And I was like, okay, you know. But I I remember it. I remember my mom's face. I remember where I was sitting in the car. And she said, I just know without a doubt that I pray over you every single day. And one day God's going to do an opening. She goes, she says, I don't know what it is. I don't know what. I remember the day that I surrendered to the preach. I struggled and I, man, I was emotional. And it's like, I went up to my mom and she was in my bedroom and she was doing something around my closet. I was at the end of the bed. I remember going up to her. I remember her turning around. And I said to my mom, I said, Mom, I surrendered to preach. She looked at me and she says, I know. She said, I've just been waiting for you to get it because God's been telling me this for years. You know, you just say those were just words. No, for me, that was like trying to figure out what God was saying to you. God just solidified in my mind, in my heart, that that was, what, that was right. The, the next thing the Bible says, it's not just that your words build people up, but your words minister grace. Do you know what grace is? It's giving something that's not deserved. It's by grace that we're saved. And the Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to you, use of edifying, that it may minister grace. It's a crazy thing. I receive grace from God every single day, okay? And God gives me that grace. And my job as a Christian is to take the grace that is unmerited and give it. Just give it. Say, they didn't do anything to it. Just give it. And the Bible says that it's going to minister grace to the hearers, to to let them receive something. And And I challenge you every single day of every single life, because of the fact is the Bible says in that next verse, be ye kind one to another. Powerful thing that God said to do. In a world that does not understand kindness because in the school setting, and we hear this all the time about people being bullied and pushed around and things. What if there was a generation of Christians that went to school, that went out of their way to be kind to that person that is the outcast and not popular? You say, well, they're not popular and they don't do anything and they don't play ball and that they're not on the team and they make bad grades and they wear ugly clothes and all this other stuff. You know, here's the crazy thing. They're not popular or valuable because they can throw a ball. They're popular. They should be valuable because Jesus died for them. 
And I know that. I know that. So I have the opportunity to treat people with value to explain to them that God loves them by the kindness that I display. Say that's odd and that's weird. You know what was odd and weird? For Jesus to go to the woman at the well and care for her when nobody else did. It was weird and kind for God to go to the woman with, with, that turned around that it was, had nothing good about her and she was thrown down in her sin and everybody was ready to throw the stones at her and he intercepted that situation. He ate with publicans and sinners. He cared for lepers. Kindness giving mercy and compassion to people that don't even deserve it or ask for it should be part of the DNA of who we are. Because you don't ever know what they're going through. You'll never know the other side. They'll never know when they're sitting there saying, does God even care about me? And where is God? And I'd like to know that there is a God. December 6, 2021, Logan's surgery failed. I was all so tore up. I was just so, so defeated. And you say, oh, God's winner and all that. I know that. But I tell you, I remember just walking through life like a zombie. See, for me, nobody knew the flip side of what I was going through. But I'm so glad that there was people in my life that would reach out to show compassion and kindness as I got into the elevator, one person reached over and they noticed who I was and they said, is your son Logan? And I was like, yes. And they said, I just want you to know that we're constantly praying for your son. I needed that. You never know what people are going through, but I got good news. God is using every single one of us that are believers that know the value of those people to be able to minister grace to the hearers. Think of this thought like this. The last verse, it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. What grieves the Spirit of God hurts or hinders the Spirit of God? Words that sow corruption. Flip the script. What pleases the Spirit of God? Edifying through your words and showing grace through what you say. What if we were a generation that not only had the mindset of being able to say the right things, but we allow God to work in our hearts and minds in such a way that we please the Spirit of God. He said, what does that mean? Come back next Sunday and I'll tell you all about it. Because there's one last verse that ties it all together and it is so important and it ties into that in the rest of the chapter. Your words hold power. How are you using your words? You better watch your words because you carry around a weapon that could bring life or death to the people you're talking to.